Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the, today's webcast. My name is Eric Carlson. I'm a partner and one of the co-founders of Propelix. It's a great turnout uh, for today's session on getting it right the first time, a day in a life of a day in a life. Uh, this is a really good and exciting topic for us um, and very appropriate, we think, for kind of where the overall enterprise mobility market is today as we see really enterprise mobile use cases moving uh, much more mature and kind of moving out of just data access type of use cases into a lot more related to process transformation. We think the day in life process and, and what Stephen's going to walk through today is a, a very important piece to kind of have as part of your skill set. And uh, we think it has a, a direct impact on the quality of enterprise mobile applications. Um, so also, it's really nice to see some clients on the call today, um, as usual. So hello to John and Mike and Veronica and Denise. It's nice to be able to see you guys today. Um, a couple housekeeping items. Um, there is a Q&A function that is in GoTo on the right-hand side of your screen on the little control panel thingy. Um, so please ask questions in there. I will either try to answer those in line or I will save them um, for Stephen for the end, or if they're good enough, I'll just interrupt them. Um, also, we're as always, there's going to be a recording of this webinar made available up on our website at propelix.com, and we also allow and always have the slides available for download as well. Um, and don't forget to visit propelix.com um, to have access to probably another 30 hours of webinar content, all um, related to all sorts of topics um, within enterprise mobility. Um, just a couple things before we get going. Um, for folks who don't know us, uh, Propelix creates mobile strategies and world-class applications for the enterprise. We have 100% focus on mobile for the enterprise, specifically how we can um, build not only customer-facing, but what we think, what we feel is on the higher value use cases for employees and partners and those types of um, individuals. Uh, we have a 20-year track record of providing enterprise-level strategy and delivered to Fortune 750 clients. Um, we help build strategies around technology use, but even more so when it, com when it comes to leveraging disruptive technologies like mobile and beacons and other types of things. Uh, for the last eight years, we've been working exclusively in mobile, um, both kind of initially on single use, more embedded devices um, like ruggedized devices, um, and, and realistically from 2010 onwards, really riding the wave of consumer mobile devices, playing a more important role um, in enterprise use cases. Um, we always try to drive to valuable use cases to employees and customers and partners for our clients. Uh, we're based in San Jose, but we have consultants across North America and um, a, a large and growing development center in Guadalajara, Mexico, um, where we focus on um, clients in North America, but a lot of our clients um, have a global reach. Um, and here's a few of those here on the next page. So um, you can see we kind of have a distribution across many different types of verticals from retail to pharmaceutical, um, to airports, to services organizations, um, to manufacturers, et cetera, um, and banking. Um, really, whenever you have um, individuals who are in a in, in a retail setting or you have people who are very mobile um, or people that are um, very mobile either within a building or across the world, um, those are obviously um, types of organizations that do well um, with enterprise mobility. A little bit on what we do, um, like I said before, uh, we, we have a, a, a growing amount of kickstarts related to enterprise mobile strategy services. Um, so these are fast-paced workshops delivered really as quickly as a single week. Um, we've really built our services and these kickstart projects around specific challenges that we see in repeated discussions with like our prospects and clients. So either starting out in initial in terms of early enterprise mobile road mapping and strategy, if there's a good map um, application idea around app scoping and prototyping, uh, we do a lot with mobile UI UX design, which we'll talk a lot about today. Um, IT strategy for mobile and helping IT groups build plans and, and strategies around bringing enterprise mobile use cases into the business. And then for more advanced clients, um, a lot of mobile center of excellence really creation, standing up, best practices, governance, et cetera, um, and more within testing strategy and support strategies and things like that. Um, we do all of our own application development work in-house for our strategy clients. So we do a lot within um, application architecture and development work. Um, we stand up and, and sit on mobile MCOEs for our clients, and we do a lot for testing and supporting um, our apps and other apps um, as a service. And lastly, two other things that we've been working on greatly lately. lately. Um, and one is the Mobile Research Council. The MRC, uh, we really built because we've been talking to a lot of organizations that are that are on the cusp of getting started with enterprise mobility, but haven't jumped in. Um, and so it's a it's a group. It's really there's no vendor um, aspect or, or kind of involvement into this. It's meant for organizations who are um, have a 
a, a lot of use cases that, are, that they're building and they're building across a mobile strategy. We have some organizations that are just getting within or getting into mobile. Um, and we do a lot of use case sharing. What are people working? What technology challenges that they had? What vendors are they working with? Um, other types of things, like just starting to get the, 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 a little bit more of a hive mind around, around good enterprise mobility and some great discussions um, every month related to that. And lastly is our enterprise products. You know, as we helped out organizations deliver enterprise mobile roadmaps and solutions, we're starting to see some really repeatable solutions um, in need of our clients. And so SureAudit uh, is an enterprise auditing and surveying platform for mobile. Exact Meeting, an enterprise built conference room and amenity finding and booking application for very large organizations. And also Lead to Capture, which is a, the best way to capture trade show leads um, and follow up and closure. These are just things that we've seen our clients build over and over. Um, and frankly, they, their internal use cases, your internal team should be focused on use cases that are much more apl applicable for only them. And we thought that we could um, deliver some repeatable applications to get some of the kind of the lower mature uh, type of use cases out of the way. So to find out about all this kind of good stuff, obviously you can go visit us at propellix.com. Um, with that, I will stop talking and let me turn it over to Stephen Brickman. Stephen has 20 plus years of experience in strategic planning and brand identity and UI UX design. He's been working for mobile for more than seven years, really assisting clients across a whole bunch of different industries, um, help build their mobile strategies, deliver great mobile experiences to employees, as well as to customers. Um, he also co-founded the Perian, which you guys might know of, a Boston-based mobile technology startup. And he's been working for us uh, on clients such as Amway and Blue Yield, Carnival Cruises, Cintas, Merck, and a whole bunch of others. So Steven, let me turn it over to you. Thanks, Eric. Um, also, I just want to mention real quick that we just launched uh, a new podcast about enterprise mobility, and uh, I'm the host of that podcast, so if anybody, uh, Eric mentioned there were some clients on this webinar, so if anybody's interested in uh, getting on a podcast episode, uh, just let us know, and uh, we can pitch some ideas at you. Okay, and there we go. So today um, we're going to be talking about how the day in the life process or also called contextual observation um, can help uh, ensure that you get an app right the first time through. So just briefly looking at our agenda, I um, have a short introduction and we'll go over what a day in the life is, what the purpose and benefits are of the day in the life process. Um, the process itself, uh, talk about some deliverables that come out of a day in the life, and uh, there'll be some case studies sort of interspersed throughout. Okay, so a day in the life is really uh, a means of understanding the end user's needs. So there are a bunch of ways that we can sort of try to understand our end user's needs uh, better, and some of the traditional approaches that we take at Propellix are um, we will conduct ideation sessions, uh, we'll conduct some business requirement sessions, we will conduct facilitated group discussions, and one-on-one -on -one interviews. So that's more of a traditional approach that can apply to desktop software, to setting up you know, network requirements, um, anything including mobile as well. Uh, so we'll, today we'll be talking about a more user-centric approach. We'll be talking specifically with the users of the software. Um, and again, there are a few other approaches uh, to understanding them better as well. Formal focus groups is one example that employs things like eye tracking and usability testing on mobile devices. Um, there's a thing called diary studies where you actually just hand out journals uh, to the users and let them sort of fill them in for themselves. And then uh, contextual inquiry, as we'll be talking about today. So what should you do before starting your day in the life? Well, the best thing is to gain an understanding of the problem and the business object objectives uh, as, as much as you can. So. So you want to know the basics, and that includes the business context, objectives, process reengineering, 
and any user challenges. Uh, sometimes these are things that come out of the day in the life process. So this is all, you know, based around the assumption that the business has an idea of what some of their problems are, what some of their objectives are, and uh, some idea of an approach to go about it. Um, you also need to find out how much change the company is actually willing to make uh, in general. Because sometimes it's not just a matter of simplifying or streamlining business processes, but it's a matter of actually re-examining entire processes to make sure that they're even necessary at all. Um, if possible, uh, you want to you want to scope the problem, and again, scope is something that can uh, oftentimes come out of the day in the life process. But um, try to establish some boundaries and scope as as much as you can early on. Um, some ways to scope uh, development are by the type of end user you're dealing with. So you could say, well, the, you know, say phase one, we're going to deal with um, we're going to deal with uh, loan consultants, for example. Uh, phase two, we'll deal with um, the customer application process. Phase three, we'll deal with the um, customer portal, things like that. That's an example from one of our uh, recent jobs. Uh, as well as um, scoping the feature complexity. So, you know, ex go for low-hanging fruit first and, and attack that and get those up so that you can get an app out there and then um, approach some of the more complex features in later phases. Um, you also want to try to identify success criteria uh, to provide a baseline so that you know uh, when the app has actually succeeded or not and what needs to be done from that point on. Okay, what is a day in the life? A day in the life is a user research tool that provides real insight into the daily tasks of users and debunks any false assumptions regarding end user behavior. So if if anybody, you know, uh, at the executive level say is telling you that their employees behave one way, uh, this helps validate those kind of claims and then debunk any uh, misconceptions. And Day in Life also draws a complete picture over a wide range of usage. Okay, here's a little more uh, articulate answer and then we will get into a very simple answer of what a Day in Life is. So. Participant observation or contextual inquiry or a day in the life is an omnibus field strategy that simultaneously combines document analysis, interviewing of respondents and informants, direct participation and observation, and introspection. In participant observation, the researcher shares as intimately as possible in the life and activities of the people in the observed setting. The purpose of such participation is to develop an insider's view of what's happening. So the goal is that the, the researcher not only sees what's happening, but actually feels it and experiences what it's like to be part of the group. All right, that's a lot of words for basically what we're uh, talking about is uh, stalking. So literally, uh, when we conduct a day in the life sessions, our strategists follow potential app users, um, whether they be employees, customers, etc. Uh, follow them around as they do their job, as they complete their daily tasks. And here you can see a picture on the right, um, Shahab with his uh, stalking strategy. He went so far as to adopt a, uh, a similar look, uh, putting on the lab coat in the, uh, in the traditional stalker fashion. Um, so a few examples might be accompanying drivers on a delivery route, exploring a client's factory and working side by side with employees, um, sitting with employees as they answer the phone and interact with customers and, and their existing software, or working in a retail store and um, alongside stalkers who are, are stalking and answering customer questions. So 
for me, uh, the day in the life process is really one of the most fun because it's a completely open process. There's no right way to, or wrong way to go about it. Uh, well, there may be a wrong way to go about it, but there's no one right way to go about it. Uh, and here, the approach to data collection is unstructured in the sense that it does not involve following through a detailed plan set up at the beginning, nor are the categories used for interpreting what people say and do pre-given or fixed. So why is this? Why is it so unstructured? Well, the reason is because this is a, a, a an exercise in discovery, and you never know what you're going to learn and from whom. So to actually apply a structure to this would would actually hinder the process and it would it would potentially prevent you from from learning things that you would otherwise miss. So this does not mean that the research is unsystematic simply that initially the data are collected in raw form and you'll see that you just want to get the data down as quickly as possible um, when you're conducting these interviews and these ride-alongs and things like that because things happen very quickly. So like I said, there's no single correct process. Um, if you think about detectives, uh, you know, Columbo versus Sherlock Holmes, two very different strategies uh, at, at basically uh, trying to find the same thing, trying to find who done it and so forth. So everybody's um, process will vary. And uh, so I've included a bunch of variations from some of our strategists throughout to give you an idea of uh, the range of variation just in the process itself. So um, this strategist describes what happened during the day as accurately as possible, taking a who, what, when, where, why, how approach, trying to stick to the facts to create a verbal snapshot of what happened. And we'll look at that uh, in an actual example pretty soon. This includes noting direct quotes and snippets of conversations, text messages, file names of voice recordings, and what photos I took. My aim is to keep description separate from analytical work for as long as possible while recognizing that these snapshots are just that, a glimpse of a point in time from a particular perspective through a particular lens. So in this case, the process is review the problem statement, ask individuals for a problem statement in their own words, which I think is, is a really uh, interesting way to go to ask the actual interviewee to state their own uh, problems uh, and then describe the organization, identify key roles, uh, uh, examine process flow and dependencies across roles and then come up with a list of individuals to interview and shadow through, through this process. So before you begin you want to identify the app's most representative target audience. Oftentimes the client will provide this list because they'll know who the target audience is better than you. So, um, But it's very important that you're talking to the folks who are actually doing the work, who are in the trenches and who will be using the app. Uh, and, and it's also important to capture a wide range of, of data. So uh, you want to capture data across various departments. You want to capture a wide cross-section of users, so experienced uh, employees along with new hires. You want to look at uh, workers at large stores versus workers at small stores, for instance, and you want to capture from various locations in order to uh, isolate any regional behavior differences and also to identify any location-specific issues, uh, things like lighting or connectivity. Uh, and You also want to try to capture a wide range of physical differences, user who's short and tall, right and left-handed, and then you want to uh, look at any accessibility needs uh, for users with disabilities and what, what the app may need to do for those folks as well. So some quick tips. Um, if possible, it's good to compare compile some scenarios to observe beforehand, um, though again the client may provide these scenarios for you. Uh, and this is sort of a, a, a psychiatry tip here to keep questions open-ended. You don't want to ask yes or no questions, you want to ask um, questions that require a, 
a more uh, articulate answer from the from the uh, employee. Uh, you got to stay alert at all times because you never know when information is going to come at you that's relevant. You want to stay open-minded and you want to withhold all judgment. That's really key because you don't want to go in there with any preconceived notions about what this app should do um, because more likely than not you will be surprised at what you learn. So withhold judgment, make no assumptions. Be empathic, uh, try to really place yourself in the role of the employee and consider that employee's state of mind at all times. You also want to take pictures and video uh, or audio to help uh, for recall later on when you're trying to summarize all your findings. Here's some pictures. You know, take pictures of things like existing forms, any maps that they use. Um, and this last one is even a picture of some of their products uh, from a, a factory. Uh, factory tour that we uh, went with um, one auto parts remanufacturing company. Okay, so some things that you want to look and listen for while you're on your day in the life. And these are real, uh, these are the big ones. You want to look at anywhere where there's a, a manual paper process um, that could be replaced with a digital process. That's a big one. That's an easy one to, to uh, to identify. Uh, anywhere where they're using third-party software in lieu of um, improving their own software is an obvious one. Uh, any, and then some more subtle things like anywhere where there's uh, shifts in the environment. So um, let's say there's a driver and he needs to work while he's on the road and then there's a like a three mile long tunnel that he has to go through. Um, so he's going to lose connectivity in that tunnel, right? So that may be an issue. And you, to, to compensate for that, you may want to adjust how data is transferred and when, right? So, um, and like I have here, the goal is that the process may be completed uninterrupted regardless of connectivity. Uh, also, things like lighting shifts even. So if, if a user is inside, they have to do some tasks inside and then they go outside, you, you're going to want to think about the shift in lighting from bright light to dim light or vice versa. Also physical challenges. Um, is the, are, are the employees hands full at any time? Do they need to be able to use voice commands to control the app? Um, are they engaged in a constant activity like driving? Um, so in which case you may want to add a drive safe mode. Um, and are there places where they're writing down information. In that case, you may want to just access the camera and use a scanner in the phone. Things like that. Okay, taking notes. So again, um, when I take notes, I have one of these um, like pulse pens and it records audio and it, it, it's so that when you write in a special pad, it digitizes the notes so you have them right away. That's, and, and it also associates what you're writing with the audio recording. Um, that's worked really well for me, uh, but I would say in general, uh, when you're taking notes, uh, speed is really the main factor. You just want to get as much information down as quickly as you can. Here's another variation from uh, one of our other strategists on how they take notes. Uh, reflections. I reflect on the day's experiences, writing about how I might have influenced events, what went wrong, and what I could do differently next time and how I feel about the process. Well, that may be a little more introspection than necessary for, um, for the client, but still interesting. Um, emerging questions and analyses. Here I note questions I might ask, potential lines of inquiry and theories that might be useful. And then future action. This is a to-do list of actions, and uh, this person includes a time frame alongside each point. So. The emerging questions and analysis may be helpful if you're conducting multiple days in the life with several players um, to just note questions that may help out in, in uh, later sessions. So here's an example from one of our day in the life's uh, a site visit and just an example of how we selected from a broad cross section of users. So. For these companies, we interviewed dealers and manufacturer dealers. 
We interviewed from three lines of businesses, including office technology, healthcare, and finance. Um, we interviewed a mix of captive DLL and competitive dealer financiers. And we interviewed from uh, along uh, several from several states: Georgia, Kansas, Maryland, and Pennsylvania. Um, and we also interviewed a mix of different roles as well, sales, sales managers, leasing agents, and executives. So the most important thing is just to capture as much information as possible from as wide a range of users as possible, and then to boil it all down to an overall uh, best case scenario for, for, the, for the app UI UX. Okay, so um, one way you're going to want to record and deliver information to the client is is by creating user personas. So this is really the why, when, where, and how of who is involved. And here are some more examples. This is from uh, a day in the life for a DLL, in this case for Carl Zeiss. So and this describes Andy Keenan, who is a salesman. Um, and uh, You'll notice some of the interesting things in here that no detail is really too insignificant. So you want to write everything down because you don't know what's going to wind up being relevant later on. So he doesn't stop for lunch. He eats protein bars to maximize his travel day. You can see the granularity that we get at here. Um, when he wasn't answering our questions, he was fielding customer calls, routing himself with his phone, and pricing deals. Uh, Andy's passengers are medical equipment secured with bungees and seat belts. So it's an odd detail, but it's one that you know may come in handy later on um, when you're trying to identify what device or what devices the apps are going to run on. You know, um, taking into account what what the uh, employee is already burdened with is maybe a big factor. So, and then here on the right, we have uh, just some, a picture of, of an existing app, and you can see it's not so impressive looking. Um, easy to use, but quotes in a phone calculator can't be saved. Okay, so right there, getting into one of the pain points. Uh, Andy, and then at the very bottom is interesting, Andy no longer uses his iPad. He has transitioned to his phone almost exclusively. So there's a case where you know an existing iPad app may no longer be useful, and that's a sort of a starting point to gaining more information about why it's not useful, right? Here's another example uh, from Enoch, and uh, and I like this one because this strategist uh, summarized how all sales calls follow a similar structure, and as we'll see later on, that's one of the things we want to look for is is repeated patterns in use. Um, and then at the very bottom, uh, selling is very relationship oriented, service based, and the rep soft selling items and services. So even going so far as to just describe the uh, the type of interactions that, that the salespeople or the employees have with the customers is important and can play a role in the design of the app later on. And again, here, with five signatures required, there are too many documents to sign to close a deal, making it feel overwhelming to the customer. So in this case, we have a customer pain point as well as um, an employee pain point. Too many documents to sign. So that's just the kind of thing that can be, that can be tightened up in a mobile app really effectively. And on the right, Although Sherpa, and again a picture of some more software that's uh, problematic, although Sherpa is a good resource in the office, remotely Kevin can't generate a proposal, deliver a proposal, or perform a quotation. So again, some pain points with some obvious uh, sounding digital solutions there to be able to generate those documents, maybe email off a PDF or so forth. One more example from Milner. And again, a picture of the software on the right. Uh, again, it's not terribly impressive looking. Uh, and a quick quote. Uh, this is what I like to do too. I like to write down quotes from the employees. What I really need in an app that I don't already have is a way to save, recall, and edit quotes. Very simple, very uh, plainly worded request. And uh, 
I like this uh, little bit of dialogue at the bottom, the bottom left. Do any of the sales folks use this app? No. Why? Too complicated? Look at it. What? You need to give it a ton of information before it tells you anything? Smile. So there, it's almost like a like a little screenplay scene right there. It's very nice. Okay, so this is these are some um, user interactions that I captured uh, from a, uh, our auto loan refinance client, Blue Yield. Um, in this case, I picked some some dialogue between the customer and the loan consultant. Um, the loan consultant trying to explain uh, how the customer was going to save $1,600 when it's only $60 a month. Uh, as well as pointing out additional benefits of the payoff, uh, being a credit score increase, and then um, one, how to deal with uh, customer objections. And then at the bottom, one uh, dealing with a skeptical customer convinced that the company was a scam. They're not a scam. Um, the uh, loan consultant said, we make our money with a document fee of $249. And he says, we save people money, and I make money myself, so I think I have a pretty good job. So there, you know, I just wanted to capture the, um, the employee's sort of state of mind and their emotional state as they're doing their job. Uh, in this case, this is sort of reveals that they're happy with their job. They're able to be fair and open and honest with customers and, and, uh, and just satisfied with the tasks that they have and it's that so in other words that's not the problem the problem is simply the software and the process that they have to go through to to process these loans so now a little bit about summarizing your findings once you've taken notes and you want to get everything organized so again multiple approaches for this but one approach is uh, you want to be sure to get these following things down if they're there. First impressions, uh, user personas, challenges, pain points, any technical issues, um, any current inefficiencies, so paper processes, uh, cutting and pasting from one you know software to another. Uh, and then what I like to do is I like to sort of keep a part of my brain devoted to thinking about possible UI UX improvements um, right from the get-go. I like to just start my brain going on that as I'm looking at all their documents and watching them use their software. And then you want to uh, add any documents uh, to, to this, uh, including photos, video, and audio, and so forth. So here's an example of some inefficiencies of um, uh, this is again blue yield. So uh, some examples, a worksheet that has to be saved as a PDF and attached to an email. Uh, that's a process that in software could all be handled automatically. Um, it, uh, worksheets are not auto-populating where they could be auto-populating with customer information. So something like auto-population reduces input errors and speeds the overall process. Um, their software had a lot of retyping that required. Um, so in this case, the software needed to be able to add a second loan and then repopulate the same fields from the first loan uh, and so forth. Uh, LCs are copying and pasting a lot of info they've already entered once. That's an obvious uh, place where efficiency can be improved. And then uh, LCs are using paper what they call the Foursquare to organize and present options to the customer. And uh, I'll show you that in a little bit as well. Uh, and then LC must confirm info provided with the customer. And that's another case where, well, they don't necessarily need to do that if the customer enters the information themselves and then confirms the information themselves. And so that's a time saver. So one more example, um, in this case, Milner. We have a sophisticated mobile user. I like that. And then uh, just a delineation of their mobile needs. So needs are being able to store quotes for later use, 
uh, being able to conduct quicker calculations faster than the numbers spreadsheet, uh, the native numbers app, and then um, to be able to generate credit application based on previously entered data. So a lot of uh, a lot of these processes are gonna. You may have seen a trend, and a lot of these processes involved redundant uh, data entry and uh, paper processes. So. So let's just look at uh, how this data can be analyzed. So some things to look for. I mentioned earlier looking for patterns is helpful. Uh, you want to look for users who are consistently performing the same act. Um, and, and you want to look at all the different ways that they're performing the same act. And you want to look at um, or focus on users who are consistently frustrated by the same task or tasks. Again, you want to use patterns to build user personas. Um, taking this user-centric approach helps create empathy overall. You want to prioritize requirements based on the personas. Um, which requirements are, or which, which problems are the most common, which are the least common, so forth. And you want to describe the user's tasks, their desired result, and their state of mind while, while uh, conducting that task, as well as um, what they're doing while they're conducting the tasks is also very important. And then finally, you want to demonstrate results. And the, the way we do it is by um, building a, a pr working on-device prototype. Um, that pretty much mirrors how the final app will actually work. And, uh, and we like to get any prototype apps into the field uh, as soon as there's enough demonstrable business value present. So this sort of goes hand in hand with scoping and, and, um, and deriving your feature set and things like that. Um, so this may be something that's agreed upon early in the process that, that the app will be released once there's enough uh, an, enough of a feature set to make it valuable to employees, rather than the full full feature, full range of features that might be used. So here's a couple of examples of deliverables. Um, at Propelix, our our uh, kickstarts are so short that we don't even really have time to generate uh, this kind of granular detail in this. Uh, attractive of a form. We focus more on, uh, you know, just putting something together in a, in a deck uh, in, in more bullet form. But here you can see, and maybe I can zoom in here. No, I can't really zoom in. But this is a what Starbucks calls their experience map. And basically it just maps the customer experience of uh, buying a coffee at a Starbucks. And you can see throughout uh, it, it, it describes in pretty uh, granular detail what the uh, customers, what they're doing, uh, how they're feeling at, at each turn, and so forth. And then here's another one that's even more granular uh, from Rail Europe. And this is the experience of a passenger uh, taking, a, taking a journey on a train. And again, if you download the slides from this, you'll be able to... Uh, to examine this in greater detail. But you can see the, um, the focus here is on the user's emotions and how the user feels at each stage of the process. OK, I just want to um, show you an example of how uh, a day in the life with uh, Blue Yield, the auto loan refinance uh, company, wound up actually translating into the UI UX, the final UI UX of the, of the software. So here's um, examples of their existing worksheets. And this is the Foursquare. And this is actually four variations of the same, uh, basically four, four ways of, of getting the same answers. And this is the, the loan consultants are allowed to sort of design their own four squares, and so each one has their own preferences. And this is an example of taking uh, different approaches and then uh, figuring out how to consolidate it all into a single best case UI that will work for everyone. 
So on the left, we have our initial sketches around how we felt the UI should work. Um, and then on the right, uh, some wireframes. So what wound up happening is we boiled the four uh, sections in the four square, and they became three columns. You see these sort of gray, grayscale columns in the middle, uh, and those offered three different loan options to the customer. Those were all generated automatically. There was very little that the LC had to do. Uh, in the past, they had to calculate all those numbers um, by, by hand, looking at spreadsheets and things like that, and using third-party calculators. And here it was all done automatically. So they basically eliminated the training process for this company because people were able to come in and begin processing loans on day one. Um, and here's the final, uh, the final design. And you can see uh, that users can uh, add and remove gap insurance, uh, add or remove an extended service contract simply by clicking those green buttons. And then you can see where it changed even from, th this process is very plastic throughout you know, the design process. So in the wireframes, we did not have a save, uh, an area where the user could, could save out. We took a different approach. Uh, using these larger buttons at the top, and then wound up going back to this sort of active area where uh, this is where things can be saved out and referred to later on. So that's sort of almost like a, a little memory bank for, for holding uh, numbers in process. So just to give you a quick summary of what we've talked about, uh, to ensure a successful day in the life, you want to talk to the folks that are doing the work. You want to talk to people out in the field, as well as executives, but you want to get all the answers, really. You, you know you're getting the right answers if you're talking to the folks in the field. Um, you want to capture from a wide cross-section of users. You want to ask as many questions as possible. Um, anything that comes to mind, uh, it's better to ask it than to just leave it a question. You want to take a lot of pictures to help your memory retrieval, especially now that we just have phones and you don't have to buy film or anything. So take as many pictures as possible. Uh, look for trends and common grievances among users. Identify pain points and inefficiencies and try to envision UI UX improvements early on because I think that'll help you get ahead of the game when it comes time to actually um, wire, start wireframing and building the user flow and things like that. All right, so where do you start? Well, here's some recommended next steps and this, is, uh, this describes our own process uh, and this is our uh, scoping and prototyping uh, kickstart and you can see that the day in the life study is just one piece in this overall kickstart. Um, step one, we will uh, conduct benchmarking and uh, to determine your business requirements. Uh, you know, we'll do a study of your business drivers, uh, market opportunities, and conduct ideation sessions with all relevant players. Uh, and in that way, we will. Uh, will determine some envisioned mobile scenarios and we will uh, determine the process definition. In step two, visualization, readiness, and road mapping. This is where we begin to road map the actual feature set of the app and we begin uh, to pursue a technical approach and we start to build the prototype. Um, at the end of step two, we will have finalized the, the full scope of what the app will do. So as I said earlier, scope is something that can either be determined early in the process or late in the process. It can go either way. And then step three, planning and budgeting. And here we, we uh, work on our budgeting and release plan and our development approach. 
And then finally, step four, uh, the prototype creation, where we will build and deploy the prototype to devices and then provide ongoing support. So I'm going to hand it back over to Eric. He's going to talk a little bit about our additional kickstarts. Yeah. Thanks for uh, signing on, everyone. Yeah, thanks, Stephen. Um, and this is like we're just scratching the surface when it comes to the in life type stuff. I do have some questions that came in for some folks as well. So let me get to those real quick before we run out of time. Just before I do that, um, what Stephen was talking just, just talking about in terms of that approach was really related to our mobile app scoping and prototype kickstart, which is in the upper left. So when we, we, we do a lot of organizations that know that there's a valuable use case idea in an area, and that area could be in a specific process or with a specific user group or in a specific geography or something, and they can see that there's value out there and they, they, they know there's something there. Um, and we work with a lot of firms like that to be able to take that knowledge and flush that out into a, a true roadmap of functionality, be able to do a prototype of that functionality like Steve talked about, and then do some data life studies, be able to do some ideation, try to understand what those business drivers are, as Steve talked about, and really flush that out into a multi-phase roadmap that has some real concrete benefits into that. Um, Steve didn't talk about it much. We, we, you know, we try to, when we build these roadmaps and when we build that solution, we're really looking for these 10x ROI apps. And knowing that if we're going to put $100,000 towards an application build, we want to be able to see a million dollars of benefit in the first 12 to 18 months after release. Like we want to be able to see where that money is going to come from and be specific around it. We have many, many, many 10x ROI apps for applications that have cost more than that. Um, and those are the types of things that we think um, is really obviously the core benefit um, within Enterprise Mobile. And there's a ton of those types of things. Um, so, so. That is really that mobile app scoping and prototype workshop. It could be as short as two weeks uh, where we do a scope and some of the stuff that we talked about first. Um, we have a bunch of folks out that are doing a, a, a bunch of day in the lives today um, that are, are car dealerships all over the nation because they're doing a day in the life today to be able to start with a scoping and prototype workshop in two weeks from now. So we typically try to do those day in the lives a little bit ahead of time. So we walk in with that knowledge. Um, and also some of the stuff that Steve mentioned today is also kind of related to our mobile UI UX design workshop. And so within that workshop, we, we've looked at, um, not that there is a need for a lot of scoping, but we've looked at a little bit more from related from a, from a UX process flow, from the overall wireframes, from how the navigation works, those types of things that we would do in the first workshop I mentioned, but maybe separate from that. So we have an application that maybe exists and we're trying to figure out how to maybe define that for mobile or maybe move it from an iPad to, an, to a, or from a tablet to a smartphone device or other types of things. Or even from web sometimes to mobile, although we try to stay away from that. We try to look at a little bit more related to the, some of the scoping and planning. Um, so anybody who is on this call, obviously we, we obviously always do a special offer for those attendees and a 20% discount for any kickstarts that we start before the end of April. So, um, Stephen, a couple questions. Steve asks, how many day in the lives should be performed before you feel you have a good understanding of the problems and the challenges? Well, I think that really depends on how many, uh, how many different roles are involved and how, you know, how large the, the user base is ultimately going to be. Is this an app that's that's going to be used, you know, uh, nationwide in thousands of stores by thousands of employees. Um, in that case, you need to get a sample from from a few different states, um, and you need to get samples from a few different, um, I would say, you know, folks of of different uh, 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 range of. You want long term employees, new hires, and new hires, and um, you want to just uh, try to grab people at all levels, salesmen and managers. So it really just depends on the breadth of the user base of the app. But try to cover as as wide a range of users and locations and abilities as possible. Um, I have two questions. I'm kind of. I think I'm going to kind of ask them together. So so Anna asks, should we stop people in what they're doing to ask questions? That's the first question. <laughs> and then the other one, which was kind of the opposite of that, Shelly asks, what do you do with users who have too many ideas, who kind of stop what they do to turn that into a requirement session? 
Yeah, interesting questions. Um, so actually, we kind of went back and forth on this when we were putting this deck together. So it's funny that you bring it up, whether or not it's okay to interrupt. I, I think it is okay. Um, uh, if you know, some people think no, because if you ask questions, you're going to interrupt the user's flow, and you may actually affect the way the process actually happens. But I, I can't imagine when that would actually occur. And in fact, and if you have a burning question and that needs to be answered, it's much more important to get the answer to a question, uh, you know, and to get some closure on that than to have that question sitting in your head and now you've got to remember to ask it later. Uh, and I think the odds of actually uh, interfering in the process are pretty low because these, you know, for the most part, these are people who've been doing this a long time. They're they're driving while they're while they're using their phone and and taking care of some of these tasks, uh, so they're used to a lot of multitasking. Um, the other question: What do you do about a, a a super chatty employee? That kind of thing. Somebody who thinks they they have all the answers already. Um, uh, I would say listen to them, but also um, you know try to try to log the fact that they are being ultra chatty and that they may uh, just sort of have that uh, character trait of being somebody who who likes to hear themselves talk or 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 likes to act as though they know all the answers. But the important thing is not to assume that they're right about everything, uh, especially if they're trying to answer for other people and to make sure that you go straight to the source for, for all the answers. Okay. Um, how about the opposite side of that? How about users who have no ideas in terms of, in terms of kind of where to take some of the processes, things like that? Are you, do you typically just watch or you try to also probe a little bit for other use cases or some ideation type of ideas as well? Yeah, I think that tends to happen more often than, than the other way, uh, that people are so used to the processes that they've been using that they don't even recognize where things could be streamlined or where improvements could be made. So in that case, it's very important to to watch and listen and, and uh, actually observe what they're doing uh, since you can't listen to what they're saying. Yeah, that can definitely be just as helpful. Okay. Um, Mike asks, should you ask, I'm sorry, should you share results and your day in the life thoughts with the participants uh, either throughout the day or at the end of the day or at a later date? Is, when, when should that kind of come together? Well, I found that um, it was very effective actually to share results um, almost right away. So at the end of a session, I like to sort of um, recap with that person to say like, well, here's what here's what I thought is happening and here's where I felt um, things could be improved for you. Um, does that does this look right to you? You know, and just to just to get a confirmation from them is is really helpful. And I found that a lot of times that part of the process also um, helps to inspire more uh, more answers from the employee where they'll say, oh yeah, that and also this other thing that sometimes happens that you didn't get to see today. And so it, it is, it is, it's a really good way to elicit more information is with that final summary with the employee or the user. Okay. Um, how about one more before we go? Uh, Deep asks, do we validate your findings on the day in life with a survey of any sort? Do you come back and survey a larger user group in any way? Um, we haven't really done that explicitly. At least I haven't really done that. Um, so taking the findings from a day in the life and then formalizing them into like some kind of survey and then sending that out. It's an interesting idea. Um, I'm not sure how much how much more could be gained by that, whether it would be worth the additional effort, but it's not typically something that I've done. Okay. Um and Fon asks if there's going to be a, just as a one last possible or one last thing, uh, Fon asks if, the, if a copy of the slides will be available. Both a recording of this webcast um, and a copy of the slides will be on our website at propelix.com probably um, in a few hours, maybe about 5 o'clock Eastern or so. So you guys will keep an, an eye out for that. And also if you're an attendee, we typically follow up with just the attendees um, with an email letting you know that those things are available. So, Stephen, thanks for your time. Great content. Um, our next webinar is going to be um, about mid-March. We're going to send an invite out coming up, and we're going to 
kind of back it off a little bit. Some of these topics we've been getting to are a little bit uh, detailed, and we're going to talk a little bit more about Enterprise Mobility 101. Um, and we're finding a lot more organizations, kind of like a, a larger second wave of companies that maybe weren't early adopters in enterprise mobility, but are now starting to think about um, valuable use cases for their employees and for partners and other types of things. And so where do you get started? Like, what are people doing with an enterprise mobility? Why is this important? What are some of the risks with security? Um, is it costly? Is it costly to do so? Um, we're just going to back it down to a, a very basic level. So that's going to be coming up um, in about three weeks from now in the middle of March. And, and you'll probably see an email invite um, for that as well. So, Stephen, thanks for your time. Great topic. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for hopping on. I hope this was helpful. And if, if any follow-up type of questions, um, just reach out to us at propellix.com and we can do a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Stephen and whomever else would make sense. So um, thanks again, everyone, and we'll see you on our next webinar.